All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Picturing Black History webinar today brought to you by Getty Images, Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective, and the History Department and the College of Arts and Science at The Ohio State University. My name is Daniela Edmire. I'm managing editor of the publication Picturing Black History and a PhD candidate in history at Ohio State. And I'm going to be your host and moderator today. So I would like to you know, express uh, thanks to everyone who is attending here live and a special welcome to everyone joining us for getting images as well. Today, we're going to be exploring an exciting new collaboration that marries powerful photographs and engaging stories to bring black history to life. Picturing Black History is a collaborative project between Getty Images and the magazine Origins, Current Events, and Historical Perspectives. Picturing Black History emerged in the wake of national and international Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George Floyd at the hands of four Minneapolis police officers in 2020. We recognize that Black Lives Matter is a contemporary outgrowth of a long history of Black racial protest in the United States. Picturing Black History is our effort to contribute to an ongoing public dialogue on the significance of Black history and Black life in the United States and throughout the globe. We embrace the power of images to capture stories of oppression and resistance, perseverance and resilience, freedom dreams, imagination, and joy within the United States and around the globe. So with that introduction, let me lay out the plan for our webinar this afternoon. Each of our panelists will speak for a few minutes about picturing Black history, exploring the amazing photographs and stories of Black history, and I will introduce each speaker before they uh, present their section. Then we will take your questions and we will open things up for discussion. If you're interested in asking a question, please write it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at end time. Uh, we've received several questions in advance and we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as we can today. So to start, uh, we are going to begin with Bob Ahern. Based in New York, Bob Ahern is the Director of Archive Photography for Getty Images and has been with the company for 23 years. Bob is responsible for the archive's overarching content strategy, which includes overview of the archive's 135 million images and 4,000 contributing photog photographers. Through a team of senior editors who continue to digitize the analog collections, thousands of images are added each month to Getty Images global offering of historic and defining cultural moments. And with that, I'm going to pass off to Bob, who's going to introduce us to Getty Images side of this project and um, explore that for us now. Thank you, Daniela. Um, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, there is a lot to get through um, in the next few minutes, so I will get straight to it, I promise. But First, I must say um, how thrilled Getty Images is to be working with the Ohio State team and the Origins team. Since we started collaborating last year, we have been so grateful uh, for all the learnings uh, that the team brings. So a heartfelt thank you to Daniela, Demarius, Nick, Stephen, David, Rihanna, and all the expertise that makes this project come alive. And likewise, sincere thanks to my many colleagues at Getty that have joined and supported the journey so far. So many of you may know Getty Images Archive from a byline in your newspaper or platform of choice, um, but we are many things besides. We are one of the first places uh, nearly a million customers around the world turn to for video, creative stills, up-to-the-minute news, sport and entertainment coverage. We just wrapped our coverage of the Beijing Paralympics. We will be covering the glitz and the glamour of the Oscars next Sunday, and we have news photographers on the ground in Ukraine. So we really are everywhere. But today I want to focus on archive, and by that I mean historical photography. And Getty Images is very proud uh, to be the custodians of uh, the world's largest privately owned commercial archive. It's a big deal for us, um, and we take our obligations seriously. The archives document all aspects of human life from the pivotal moments of history right through to the triumphs, adversities, and minutiae of everyday life. And in order to make that accessible, that history, we have multiple preservation facilities around the world where we work with the original analog photographs, some 135 million of them to be, um, well, fairly precise. And this is what that looks like. This is a photo of our London facility that houses 80 million of those prints and negatives and preserves almost every conceivable format of photography. Much of the archives are comprised from the press agencies of yesteryear, archives inherited from the so-called golden age of photojournalism. From the 1930s onwards, as both printing and camera technology evolved, it was these 
vast collections that service the huge explosion and demand for visual media. But we also go right back to the very birth of photography. In fact, one of our collections, the LSC collection, was operating in the 1850s and is widely credited as being one of the first photo agencies ever to license a picture. But as mind boggling as those stats and numbers can be, it is the people that work on site with this material that keeps archive living and breathing. We have editors, researchers, production staff, as well as a rolling curatorial and conservation program that means we can continually curate our archives on a daily basis. Without that expertise, we would simply be custodians of 135 million pieces of plastic, paper, and glass. So the message I want to convey about our archive is that it never stands still. And much like the team at Origins, we work hard to demonstrate how sharing our visual pasts can allow our audiences to contextualize and understand the present. So we are constantly evolving our historical coverage and assessing how does it meet the moment. And of course, there was no more important time to do this than in the summer of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd. So as we look back at the historical coverage of those, sorry, excuse me, one second, there we are. So as we look back at the historical coverage that echoed those present events, we will find some of the most recognizable and powerful work that we may all know today. In particular, surveying the civil rights struggle in the 50s and 60s, we will find some of the photos that helped move the world, influence the course of that history. Work from photographers such as Steve Shapiro, Flip Schulka and Charles Moore proved that the power of photography to influence public opinion and help bring positive change. Flashback to Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, and Charles Moore's shocking photographs of police brutality circulated around the world and galvanized support for the civil rights movement. According to former US Senator Jacob K. Javits, Moore's pictures helped to spur passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Photographs such as these can still be difficult to look at. This image on the right was taken 19, uh, sorry, the image on the right from the Bettman collection was taken on September 4th, 1957. That was three years after the Supreme Court had ruled that the segregation of public schools was unconstitutional. But this was the first day of school for students at Little Rock, Arkansas. We see the remarkable composure of 15 year old student, Elizabeth Eckford. She's in the foreground here, carrying her school books, being heckled and surrounded by anger and hate. And it's a moment captured only as photography can do. It's as visceral as it is shocking as the day it was taken. But much as photography can be used to document or division or conflict, it can also be used to unite and help us understand. And actually there is a fascinating postscript to this image about how, how it ended up bringing some of the subjects to something of a reconciliation. But underneath this layer of very recognizable photography, there are often gaps in the visual record, the photos that help us really understand the complexities of daily life that explore beyond the headlines. The, day, the archives of daily life, of black daily life, of community, sideline figures in history, narratives maybe we never learned about at school, and importantly, photographs taken by photographers who were part of that community. And our ambition is to both uncover and better surface content that has traditionally been underrepresented. And we can do this in a number of ways. First, we can revisit our own analog collections. Just 1% of our analog holdings are digitized. So that gives us a huge opportunity to revisit those files with an edit with a contemporary agenda and to seek out the content that may be overlooked for decades. And photo editors can do this thanks to the original finding aids, index cards, original day books, all the analog tools that we still use to provide cataloging of this content. It's a real excavation. But we also acknowledge that no matter how methodically we research our own archives for content we would like to see more of, it simply may not be there. After all, the dominant paradigm of white owned mainstream media and news coverage in the 20th century, and even though many magazines photo output will be held to high journalistic account, it did not typically leave behind a diverse footprint. So in seeking a more inclusive visual history, we look to partner and collaborate with other archives where black voices and black photographers are central. One such partnership uh, is with the Carnegie Museum of Art who preserved the incredible Teeny Harris collection. Charles Teeny Harris was the preeminent photographer for the Pittsburgh Courier, one of America's most prominent black newspapers. He was photographing Pittsburgh's African-American community from 1935 to 1975. And what you get from Harris's archive is the view from a photographer who was trusted by his own community documenting that community. 
So here you will see a more nuanced and longer form body of work, an often more positive and authentic representation of black life and culture, totally independent of a white lens. And most recently, we were thrilled to award uh, a half a million dollars grant to four historic black colleges. Actually, today is the very first day that we're on site at Jackson State to initiate that digitization. And the grants will be used to digitize over 100,000 new photographs relating to HBCU life and black history and culture. So we really have some exciting times ahead. And alongside that work undertaken in the analog world, we've also been working with external consultants and experts to help digitally curate our content to ensure that we navigate this path with thoughtfulness and care. We are learning, we're listening, and as part of this approach later this year, we will be offering a collection of roughly 25,000 digital images that explore black history and culture and will be made available for free and for non-commercial use. And lastly, I want to leave you with some fascinating research carried out by my rather brilliant colleagues in our Creative Insights Division. One of the many things that they do is to find out and also predict how the world at large interacts and consumes photography. And here's what they found. Data shows that nearly half of Americans believe in the importance of learning black history. The top three sources by which Americans learn about black history and culture are cited as documentaries, news media, and elementary and secondary schools. So if I may recall the earlier statistic that Getty Images has nearly 1 million customers around the world, and that includes just about every media outlet on the planet, as well as documentary makers, production houses, corporate and agency customers who are all looking to make an impact. If you pair that together with Ohio's extraordinary work in the educational and curriculum space, we have a very urgent but long-term and sustainable opportunity to influence the conversation, surfacing inclusive histories that can positively influence the world at large. And that's why we are excited about the project Picturing Black History, which seeks to do just that. And with that, thank you very much indeed for listening and I'll hand you back to Daniela. Thank you, Daniela. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. That was really fascinating to get a look behind the scene of what's going on in the archives and how, you know, photographers and photographs are gathered. Um, so our next panelist uh, is Demarius Johnson. Demarius Johnson is associate editor of Picturing Black History. He's also a doctoral student in the Department of History at The Ohio State University. His research interests include histories of civil rights and black power, African decolonization and museum studies. So with that, I will hand it over to Demarius, who will talk to us about Black history, his uh, research, um, and his his writing for Picturing Black History. Well, thank you, Daniela, and I'm glad to join you all this afternoon. So we'll get started. Uh, I think a, a fitting place to start in thinking about Black history and specifically about this project is with the name, the image of Carter Godwin Woodson uh, pictured here. Uh, he had been known by his contemporaries uh, as the father of Black history, and uh, it's just important to review a few aspects of his long and, and fruitful contribution to uh, Black history and to American history to kind of frame and understand the trajectory of this project. Uh, so Woodson was born 1875 in Buckingham County, Virginia. Uh, he was the son of two uh, formerly enslaved coal miners, and in his early years, uh, he was literate, so he often read the newspaper to his father, uh, to fellow farmhands and, and local residents. Uh, he would later attend and complete uh, his bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago in 1907. Uh, in 1908, he uh, attended the Sorbonne in, Fair in Paris. Uh, and then in 1912, he was the second uh, African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard after W.E.B. Du Bois uh, in the Department of History. Uh, more specific to this project, uh, in 1915, he started the Association for the Study of, of African-American Life and History, uh, which is today known as uh, ASALH. And uh, in 1926, um, ASALA, also a kind of colloquial name for ASALH, um, started the celebration of Negro History Week, uh, which fell uh, the week in February between the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Uh, and in the late 1960s uh, became today known as Black History Month um, as a result of uh, student activism in the late 1960s, expanded the week from a month uh, to a month of celebration of African-American history. And uh, what's important to note about Woodson's work is that the, his main impetuous and motivation for establishing Negro History Week uh, was to counter a lot of the stereotypical uh, images uh, and the historical bias 
uh, of the American historical curriculum. And so in trying to achieve that goal, uh, he really became active as an advocate and exponent of, of Black history in multiple uh, spaces, uh, in academic spaces, in public spaces, uh, and really in a community celebration, uh, Negro History Week, uh, which became Black History Month, uh, which is also important to recognize about Woodson, uh, that Negro History Week is a celebration of an entire community uh, and is not about a great man, um, but is about his relationship to a great people who produced him, uh, to a great people that he sought to document and write about and circulate the histories of, and to the generations of great people that would sustain his work uh, in Black communities and in the broader American public from 1926 uh, to our present day. Uh, so another image, this image is uh, taken from 1963. Uh, this is an image captured in Kenya in 1963. On the left, we have Joma Kenyatta. Uh, Kenyatta was uh, prime minister and first president of independent Kenya. Uh, Kenya gained its independence in 1964. Uh, 1963, we also have in this image uh, to his right, to the right of Kenyatta is uh, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall is known his uh, significant contribution to African, to African American history. Uh, as one of the lawyers who, who led the charge in Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. And of course, as the first African-American Supreme Court justice in 1967. Uh, what ties them together uh, is in 1960, a uh, few years before this picture is taken, uh, Thurgood Marshall is important for being involved in a series of conventions that would establish the constitution of independent Kenya. Um, he was involved in a series of meetings called the Lancaster House uh, Conferences. There were three meetings. Uh, he drafted a Kenyan Bill of Rights, and he was really integral for thinking about what Kenyan independence might look like uh, in 1960. And then in 1963, when it's achieved, um, he's very prominent for thinking about how the specific forms of African independence, what sp specific forms of uh, government that would take. And so Kenyatta is a beneficiary of that spade work that is done by Thurgood Marshall. Uh, this picture is also interesting to me because there are not many images of Thurgood Marshall laughing. And so I also wondered what is happening at the specific meeting uh, that they both seem to be having a good time. So the next image that I wanted to focus on uh, is from 1984. This is from a press conference at the White House. Uh, this is President Reagan unveiling a uh, postage stamp that honors the name of Carter G. Woodson. Now, 1984 is, of course, an election year, so there's some political uh, posturing here in terms of why Woodson might be uh, recognized uh, during the election year. And of course, in the kind of backdrop of that, there's a Jesse Jackson uh, presidential run. And so Reagan is certainly aware of the kind of political climate that he's operating in. Uh, but what's also significant is the kind of the, the backdrop of folks which are a little bit difficult to see here. Um, and in some of the individuals standing behind Reagan, those are the folks who organized uh, to achieve this public recognition of Woodson uh, by an American president. And uh, some of the members standing behind Reagan are actually uh, members of a, a national committee uh, that gathered to think about the, the first, uh, there's, a, there's a National Center for the Study of African American History and Culture. Uh, there's a museum that's actually founded uh, about an hour and a half away from Columbus in Wilberforce, Ohio. Some of the members of that committee, uh, which founded that museum in Wilberforce um, that it honors African-American history and culture. Uh, this Wilberforce Museum uh, was the first national museum that was granted federal funding uh, to tell a national story of African-American history. And so these folks that are pictured behind Reagan that advocated for Woodson's prominence at this press conference on this national stamp are also involved in other ways of circulating black history across the United States of gathering the American public to think and engage with African-American history, and are also institution builders, uh, which Woodson was as well. So these are folks in that long line um, from Woodson um, to the present, which have also thought about how to teach and learn about Black history in public spaces um, outside of the university, which is another significant theme of African-American history. So it's important to recognize that in this moment, 1984, Carter G. Woodson in Black History Month attains a certain kind of official recognition uh, in President Reagan, but also to recognize the kind of grassroots organizing and community work that sustain the holiday uh, is what achieves that official uh, presidential recognition and what is the kind of underlying uh, energy that sustains the holiday today. Uh, so the last image I wanted to, to talk about is actually from the uh, 1980. 
Uh, this is just a, a community gathering in 1980. I'm not sure if it happens in February. Um, I couldn't tell from the photo credit, uh, but this is a community gathering in, in 1980. And what we see pictured here is a uh, bookseller and some patrons um, at a, a black community event in 1980. And I think that this is a very important uh, representation of what Black History Month represents in that this is a community event. Uh, this is about teaching and learning. And uh, this is a, also about uh, the circulation of, of the Black dollar within the Black community, um, as these folks will purchase products from this bookseller. And that revenue that they generate um, and, and the relationships that they have uh, allow for kind of circulation of, of Black uh, money through the Black community. Um, that's also an important aspect of this image and, and what this represents. Um, we see pictured in the kind of backdrop uh, behind the bookseller. This is a, a zoomed in version of that. Uh, we see a poster that reads or, or some words that read Black History and Liberation, which again uh, reiterates another point which Woodson understood in, in creating uh, the, the idea of a community celebration uh, for Black history, which is that African-American history in the United States is always taught uh, in the face of political opposition, and that the significance of this history uh, is to center the histories of race in, in American history, and so that the United States uh, history cur curriculum can come to terms with histories of race, but also for African American people, for people of African descent in the broader world, Black history is important for thinking about liberation and what liberation can look like, what resistance to opposition can look like, uh, what kinds of uh, legacies and achievements have been part of that broad chronicle of Black history, which is in fact about African American history and um, the community, broader international communities of African people. And another example of that uh, is the poster underneath, which is torn, reads March 2nd, uh, Day of Angolan Women. And this is important, again, for drawing out the relationship between African Americans and African history. Uh, in thinking about Black History Month and gathering to think about and study Black history is inseparable from Africa, is inseparable from African resistance struggles. Uh, and that is pictured in 1963, but it's also pictured in 1980. And that is also part of the contemporary work uh, of Black history and Black political movements and thinking about the ways that uh, Black Lives Matter could be seen as an example, a, a, a riff on that theme of the kind of global ways that people of African descent find community with each other and then use that broad sense of community to challenge the particular political circumstances in which they find themselves. Uh, and that is part of the kind of broad contribution of Woodson in terms of foregrounding this work and this history and what it means to black communities. And so um, I just wanted to feature some of those images and uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Demarius. That was really enlightening. Um, we are going to move on to our next speaker, who is Don Chitty. Don Chitty is the Director of Education at the African American Civil War Museum, where she has worked since 2010. She holds a doctorate in education in which she focused her research on the topics of museum curriculum and pedagogy about slavery and abolition in the United States, and the importance of historical memory and its connection to inclusive pedagogy, which she will be discussing with us here today. So Don, I will pass it off to you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, probably one of the most important requests I get from researchers and the general public at um, the museum where I work is uh, one for pictures. Uh, with the Civil War, it's um, very novel and new. Um, so this is like one of the first wars where we have like so many images. Um, pictures capture moments in a way that documents can't. So it's really neat to see them for the Civil War time period. Um, we can tell a lot from them that we can't tell from just looking at documents. For example, uh, just looking at Lincoln, we can tell the physical toll of um, being president during the American Civil War uh, that it had on him just by looking at pictures of him before the war and during the war. But unlike with documents, context is hard uh, to pick up with just images, which is one of the reasons why I like the Picturing Black History Project, having the opportunity to build a story uh, with the photos helps people to understand events or historical fi figures better. Uh, I've done two articles, uh, the first of which was uh, Learning in Secret Places, which is about Susie King Taylor. Uh, so you're looking at an image of Susie King Taylor, which was taken in the late 1800s. Uh, this is well after the war. This is almost like the turn of the century um, for her, but she was 14 years old um, when she gained her freedom and she became a nurse and started to teach Black soldiers how to read and write. 
of education for enslaved people was an accomplishment, one that um, could earn you the strictest of punishments um, before the war and some parts in the early part of the war as well. Susie King Taylor learned to read and write uh, like in a secret school. Education was not um, promoted amongst blacks free or enslaved because the ability to read and write contradicted the idea of blacks being um, intellectually inferior and revealed ideas of human equality that might encourage rebellion. So she learned to read and write in a secret school in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, the experiences of learning to read and write she carried with her when she gained her freedom into the camps teaching soldiers how to read and write. And uh, those experiences of learning to read and write and also teaching, uh, she led her down the path of establishing uh, not just one, but uh, a few um, private schools for blacks after the war. The last, um, this image is uh, an image of a school in um, Edisto, uh, South Carolina. Uh, and the next image is uh, a similar, similar image of a school um, in the South. And um, this is something that you would have seen uh, at the latter part, later part of the war, uh, well into the 20th century, uh, these schools popping up um, after freedom came because that's one of the things that um, Blacks did was seek to be educated uh, and it was legal to do so. So uh, Susie King Taylor um, writing this article was um, important to me uh, because it was um, a way of, to show how Blacks educated themselves in their communities throughout the 19th century, but also as an educator, I admire Taylor's uh, teacher spirit. Uh, the next article I wrote uh, was um, At War with Memory. I was influenced by my um, conversations with the public and about Civil War monuments and historic memory. I realized that the legacy of the Civil War was different depending on uh, the person um, you were talking to. And the monumental landscape uh, reflects the dominant uh, voice in society at the time. So in the early 1900s, you see a lot of uh, monuments to the Confederacy that go up, but they don't necessarily outnumber um, monuments to the Union, they just get more notice. Uh, the first image you're, that you're looking at is the Confederate monument on Stone Mountain in Georgia. This monument is about 60 feet high and is carved in the face of a mountain and features three prominent Confederate figures, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Jefferson Davis. Although not the largest monument um, or even the oldest to the Confederacy, it's notable. And the influ it, it influences the narrative of the Civil War and is located on a site that is heavy with racial meaning. The site was chosen for this memorial because it was the site where the Ku Klux Klan uh, had its revival in 1915. The next picture is the anniversary shot from the Battle of Gettysburg. If you look through a lot of the pictures from uh, the anniversary of the Civil War. This is the 50th anniversary of the Civil War and even the anniversary for the Battle of Gettysburg. You'll notice that there are a few Blacks in these images, even though um, Blacks were in a, a huge number um, serving as soldiers during the Civil War. Um, the theme of the anniversary was uniting the blue and the gray. Blacks were not a part of that reunification. Black soldiers made up 200,000 soldiers for the Union and by the war's end, uh, their valuable contributions towards preserving the Union of the United States and ending slavery was noted, but became a distant memory. So uh, I only was able to include one image of a soldier in my article, but I'm able to share with you two images. Uh, so soldiers took a lot of images. It was, like I said, it was a novelty. So you'll find that there's a lot of uh, soldier images from the time period, most of which are unidentified because of course, even though it was a novelty and free to take a picture, it was not free to take the picture with you. So a lot of times you have photographers that are going through and you have these studios where they're taking pictures and they have these copies of these um, images that uh, make their way into repositories like Getty Images or the Library of Congress, et cetera. Uh, so this is one image of you know, a soldier that served during the Civil War. And uh, here's another one. Uh, so this is basically what the soldiers would have looked like. Um, when we think about Blacks in the collective history of the Civil War, it's as an enslaved person and not uh, people who endured the yoke of slavery and played a part in emancipating themselves. These two soldiers um, here are 
in all likelihood, um, they were enslaved at the start of the war. Their fight was one of freedom first and union second. For many, the war carries the legacy of emancipation. Four million blacks gained their freedom. The, memory, the memorials uh, show how the legacy of the war is, is expressed. I was unable to add in my um, article um, a image of Lincoln emancipation statue, um, which I thought it was in here, but it's not. Uh, Lincoln emancipation statue, um, because it's a controversial um, image that shows basically a freedman uh, who was kneeling at Lincoln's feet. The statue was paid for by blacks, but they didn't get um, a say in the design. So it doesn't necessarily represent the expression of their um, remembrance of the war. Um, these last two images are of the African-American Civil War Memorial. Um, the first one shows a group around the memorial. Likely some of these individuals were descendants of the soldiers that are listed at this memorial. Um, and the second one just shows the memorial by itself. Uh, the Civil War was important in defining the course of the nation, um, what kind of country we would have, but its memory can determine if uh, those um, hard lessons that we fought over during the Civil War would be lasting. Memorials are a tangible piece of uh, the past that give a road map to how something should be taught to generations, to future generations, and speak to our shared past. Uh, these two articles for me are about perspective. Um, there are different viewpoints to the past depending on the person. This doesn't necessarily change the facts, but it affects our understanding of the facts and how they impact us today. Black history is important because it represents an often marginalized viewpoint um, that when we overlook it, we overlook the contributions of many Americans that help build and shape the nation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. Like Demarius, that was an excellent um, exploration of unasked, unappreciated, underappreciated aspects of history and, and the importance of, of Black history and education in the United States. Um, so last but not least, let me introduce to you our final panelist for today, James Morgan. James Morgan is programming consultant with the African American Civil War Museum and a graduate student at Morgan State University and the author of The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867 through 1906. So with that, I will pass it off to James. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniela. Uh, I uh, don't know how I can follow up uh, such dynamic speakers. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my good friend Demarius uh, Johnson. Uh, before going to Morgan State and before you all took him uh, up there in Ohio, he and I both attended Howard University together. And um, I can say for myself that my experience uh, now being uh, a two-time HBCU uh, student graduate and also do uh, instruction here as well, um, it influenced me quite a bit when I first uh, learned about this project. And uh, one of my interests, like many people in history, is genealogy. Uh, today, I'm not gonna speak about uh, family history, but I do want us to think about the intellectual history of Black uh, liberation uh, efforts through time and through space. Um, and so in order to do that, we had to use a starting point. And for me, uh, as far as my uh, this project goes, uh, I wanted to start with Martin Delaney. Uh, the title of my uh, submission was Martin Delaney, uh, Unapologetic African. And the reason why I chose that title was because Delaney uh, was known uh, for being very, very proud of his African heritage. Uh, Martin Delaney's family history is one that is uh, very important uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go back on something I just said, because we are going to talk about his family history very briefly. Uh, if you ever get a copy of Martin Delaney's autobiography, uh, the first chapter is entitled Genealogy. And what he lays out is that uh, his grandparents, particularly on his mother's side, uh, were, uh, were Africans who were brought over to the United States and were freed. Um, this similar story happened with his, on his father's side as well. The interesting thing that happens on his mother's side, though, is that according to Delaney, his maternal grandparents were adults who were already married to each other in Africa and then captured, brought to the United States together. And so from an institutional uh, perspective, marriage is an important marker for human life, right? Because we understand that they must have been of a certain age, had a certain understanding of history, culture, lives, et cetera, because they would have 
been of, of proper age, uh, according to their, to their people. And, and according to Delaney, they came from somewhere around Nigeria. Now, Delaney himself is born free. Uh, that's when he was a child, his mother was, was free. His father was still enslaved. Fortunately, his father was able to gain his freedom uh, during Delaney's childhood. Um, the family actually has to move from what is now West Virginia, but at the time was still a part of the state of Virginia. Uh, they move into uh, Pennsylvania. And Delaney, uh, as he grows, learns to read. Uh, matter of fact, the fact that he and his siblings were learning to read is the reason why the family had to relocate. Um, as he matures, Delaney goes into uh, becoming a physician's assistant. At the time, leeching and cupping were very common uh, medical practices, and Delaney became a specialist at this. Uh, Martin Delaney actually becomes one of the first men of African descent admitted to Harvard University's uh, School of Medicine. However, after a few short weeks, uh, they are all dismissed because of the outrage of uh, a number of white students and faculty who actually write to the president and to the administration of the school uh, saying that they wanted them uh, all uh, uh, put out. Okay, uh, one, of the, one of the things that often gets left out of that story is one of the, the kind of tipping point uh, is you had Delaney and two other men of African descent uh, who were in the program, but then Harvard was thinking about admitting a woman. And that was a, a, uh, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Now, moving forward, Delaney is very well known uh, during this period as a publisher. Uh, he uh, starts his own newspaper called The Mystery. Uh, he also uh, becomes very active in both the African Methodist Episcopal Church, as well as Prince Hall uh, Freemasonry as well. Uh, Delaney is well known for being uh, outspoken about his pride in African history and heritage, which is something that is really, really ahead of its time during his, his lifetime during the 19th century. Um, it was very famously said by Frederick Douglass that Douglass himself said that he woke up every day proud that God had made him a man but Martin Delaney woke up proud that God had made him a black man. And this held true. The two of them worked together on the, uh, the newspaper, The North Star as well. Um, and during the uh, lead up to the Civil War, Delaney actually goes to Africa. He travels there uh, with, with a man by the name of Robert Campbell. Uh, he stops in Liberia, then Nigeria, looking for land for hopefully to allow for African-Americans to resettle uh, back in their native homeland. Uh, but then the Civil War kicks, and he actually does meet with some success, but then the Civil War kicks off and he comes back to the United States. Now, this photograph that we have here, this tintype, is of Delaney actually um, in uniform. Uh, there, are, there are several images of Delaney, um, which, 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 uh, which we can talk about. But I chose this one specifically because there was a major issue at the time, and, and I think this is probably a, a discussion that we can have uh, with our friends at Getty Images about how cameras, the science of cameras and lenses uh, really was not always complementary up really up until the modern day of people with darker skin tones. And so Delaney's taking this picture to show his bold blackness as well as how distinguished he is uh, in, in his military uniform or what have you. Uh, this was something that in and of itself was a, a sign of protest in my view. Uh, and the fact that he's not cowering uh, what have you, but he's looking as a respectful human being who's proud of how he how he appears and presents himself in the world. Now, for me, this is an this is the original voice that we see echoed a generation or two later with the rise of this man here, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, who in many ways uh, is kind of a second coming, if you will, of the philosophy of Martin Delaney. Uh, Garvey is known for being the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, an African Communities League, uh, originally from Jamaica. And uh, initially, what Garvey wants to do is to establish a school similar to Tuskegee Institute in his native Jamaica. Uh, he decides to do this after he travels around the Caribbean, he goes to Panama, and Garvey famously states that everywhere he traveled, he saw uh, black people being oppressed and he wondered where were their men of big affairs, where were their men of big business and politics what have you. And since he said he could not find them, he would make them, he would craft them himself. Uh, and so uh, he organizes uh, what is uh, known to be the largest uh, single organization of black people in modern recorded history. Uh, and when he comes to Harlem, New York, uh, his movement uh, sparks a wildfire. There are chapters of the UNI ACL established throughout the United States, uh, the rest of the Americas, even going over into Africa and the Caribbean um, as well. 
uh, one of the things I think is interesting about Garvey, and you see him oftentimes depicted in this kind of military, uh, chivalric type of almost fraternal uh, uh, uniforms, is that in some ways you can kind of see the echo of Delaney uh, as one of the first Black Civil War uh, officers having served as a major. And Garvey himself did state that Delaney was one of his biggest influences. And you can kind of see that uh, even visually. Now, one last thing about uh, Marcus Garvey is that Garvey is also famous for uh, crafting the red, black, and green flag, the black liberation flag, which is often used even down to today with uh, even down to today's Black Lives Matters protests. Uh, Garvey himself said uh, that, you know, he should be, that you could look for him in the whirlwind uh, as one of his most famous statements. Uh, when he was being oppressed and, and uh, arrested by the federal authorities. And for me, when I think about that quote, and I think about the turmoil that uh, this nation and the, and the world have been in concerning issues of race um, and, and, and other forms of oppression, I, I think I, when I first saw this image, it made me think immediately of that voice, that echo that starts with a Martin Delaney or a Susie King Taylor, passes through a Garvey and ends up down to you and I today and produces a project like Picturing Black History. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize that when we see these type of protests, whether they're marching the streets, whether it's debates in courtrooms or what have you, that we recognize that historical echo that started so long ago and that we continue to have the conversation. So uh, clo in closing, I would just say I'm very proud to be a part of this project and to be working with you all to continue the conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, James, and, and thank you so much um, for the rest of our panelists for those fascinating discussions on Black history and photography and, and you know, being able to share this exciting introduction to picturing Black history to our audience here. So now we'd like to open the floor to anyone in the audience who'd like to ask a question. If you haven't already, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have a question or comment for our panelists, please type it in there um, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so to start off, we have a few specific questions that I'm going to direct towards you, Bob. Um, for a couple of questions came in asking specifically about Getty Archives collection. Um, so what is the oldest date in photos um, at Getty and what is the date of the oldest photo in the Getty Images collection on Black history in the US? Um, and specifically thinking about the collection in terms of um, photography as a, a relatively recent medium, um, but also the kind of uh, exclosure, or maybe that's not the right word, but the kind of the lack of, of focus on, on documenting Black life and how that relates to kind of the history and collection at Getty Images. You're muted, Bob. Of course, I'm muted. Two years in, it's uh, yes. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a great question, and I, it, it can it, it can get um, a bit of a movable feast in terms of when we start to date photography um, from the very early days. I mean, we've nearly had two hundred years of photography. It seems incredible to think about it, um, but it is still very still very young. We we have the daguerreotypes um, that, that stretch back to sort of 1839, 1840. So. Really, you know, only a decade or so after the real pioneers were were, were starting to make those photographs, um, and that's um, by Fox Talbot. You know, some of the the real pioneers of photography. Um, we keep a lot of that in our um, vintage room. We have a kind of a special place at the London Archive where um, we try and extract um, more valuable or more unique photography out from the working files um, to, to to preserve um, for future generations. Um, in terms of black life in the U.S. It's, that's um, that's trickier. I would need to do a little bit more research on that. Obviously, we saw um, some of those depictions of soldiers that Dawn, um, Dawn was highlighting in there from obviously around 1840s, 1850s. Um, but again, it can be it becomes difficult to date sometimes. Um, you can look at the process, whether it's a tin type or a daguerreotype, you can start to make assumptions about where they were. But um, in terms of um, collections, um, we do represent uh, a collection, the Afro newspaper collection, which um, is one of America's oldest um, black newspapers and it's, it's still going, obviously, it's still in circulation. Um, and they date, they date back, um, gosh, 128 years, I think. 
um, in terms of that history. Um, and that would be more of daily life um, in terms of, you know, covering uh, its, its agenda at the time rather than, rather than tintypes and portraits of, of that nature. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, it's fantastic. And as far as, you know, expanding the collection and a focus on those unseen moments in history and daily lives and things of that nature, um, can you speak about what else we might expect from the HBCU project in the future? Yeah, I, that's going to be a big one. And I, I think I mentioned, you know, we're, we're literally there today as the first day, but we had many months of um, collaborating with the photo archivists at uh, Jackson State, Prairie View, um, North Carolina Central. Um, uh, and, and amazing, amazing teams that are working, you know, with, with their archives. And, and there's so many uh, stories to uncover. There's so many photographers and bylines, um, whether we're talking about Mr. Cecil Williams um, or the Teal Portrait Studio, names that are kind of new or are going to be new to, to some folks. And um, uh, it's going to be exciting to see what we can pull out of that. So 100,000 images, um, the photo arch archivists at the HBCUs know their content. Um, and it's about bringing it to the rest of the world and, and, and having more um, imagery to look at and to um, explore. And as I think Dawn eloquent, very eloquently put, you know, it's about slowing down with photography and it's about using a single picture to help decode so much. There's so many pivots you get out of a single picture. There's so much history contained in that. So it's not all about a numbers game. In fact, it's, it's, it's almost the opposite as we, th as we think about and slow down and, and approach photography in a, in a, in a, in a more considered way. Um, and I've just been knocked out by um, what the authors have, have contributed so far, just using single pictures. It's, it's an incredible reminder. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so Don, we have a question for you. Um, specifically, I think relating to your um, Learning in Secret Places piece. Um, so a uh, audience member asks, what does it mean to have private black schools? Does that mean what it means today, i.e. Uh, privileged, I am assuming in terms of, you know, uh, paying for private education in that nature? Well, some of the schools were, uh, did carry a cost to them, um, but keep in mind that during this time period, there were not that many metropolitan areas that had uh, public schools. So public schools are just basically very new. In fact, actually, um, Susie King Taylor established her schools because there were no private schools in her area. So she was seeking to offer education where there was no opportunity for that in the community in which she lived in, which is one of the reasons why a lot of private schools kind of like popped up um, during that time period. And there's um, even people today uh, into like that were born in the early 1900s going through the 1920s. Uh, they went to private schools. My own grandmother went to a private school, uh, not because there was like, you know, a privilege thing attached to it, because that was the only school that was available to them. Uh, Susie's schools went out of business because they, the private schools did make their way into her area. And uh, there was a competition between um, her schools, there was a price attached to it, and the private, the public school, there wasn't one. So it wasn't necessarily privilege, but more of access. Great, thank you so much for answering You're that welcome. question. Um, so now we're gonna turn to a larger question and I will direct this to Demarius first and then James, if you'd like to speak after Demarius because you kind of ended on these similar themes at the end, I think that'd be great. Um, so what are the ways in which photography can help bring history to life and help people understand the past? And are photographs especially important to understanding Black history? Yes, I, I think that photographs are, are very important just for capturing moments in motion, but also for thinking about uh, what individuals come to represent. And I think that that's thinking about representation, thinking about the kinds of people that get photographed um, and in the movements that they're connected to and how folks, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the Thurgood Marshall image, for example, uh, what that comes to mean about African-American civil rights history, about civil rights in the United States and how it's connected to these broader uh, conversations, that that's a, con that's a theme that you can talk about because you see it pictured in the image. So I think what pictures allow for you to unpack and talk about in terms of connections uh, is really very important because people that are African descent around the world are often connected with each other. And one of the ways to, to demonstrate or illustrate that uh, is through photographs. 
Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Demarius. Um, I think that we have to be mindful that every day each of us uh, gets up out of bed or off the couch or what have you, and we get dressed and we go out and present ourselves to the world. Um, each one of us on this panel has done so today, or some of us may be home, what have you. When I wore this shirt, I wanted to, to communicate something. Um, you know, when Daniela, I know your hair is different last time from last time I spoke to you. Uh, you know, you want to, you want to communicate something in in your style of dress and, and what have you. The, the photo in back of me, that's actually a family photo from my own family. They were trying to communicate something through um, through their style of dress and what have you. Um, and I think that that's part of the beauty of photography, uh, as Demaris is saying, is to show an honest depiction of what is it that is being trying that, that, that the people are trying to communicate. Um, you're talking about a time period, and I think Frederick Douglass was um, a master at this, being one of the most photographed people of the 19th century. Um, you're talking about a time period where, let's not forget, before photography comes into existence, the main visual medium is art, is people are drawing and painting and what have you. And African people are not being portrayed realistically not being portrayed in a distinguished manner. They're being portrayed as subhuman, right? With these huge lips and, you know, all these different things. And all that. They're being portrayed as caricatures, even down in the history of animation, really down into the 20th century. So photography and later video gives these people the ability to control their own image and representation uh, all the way down to the present. So yes, I think it's very important. Great, thank you so much, James and Demarius for answering that very broad, but you know, well put answer to that broad question. Um, Bob, so I have a few more questions for you about kind of the behind the scenes at Getty Images. Um, so a two part question here for you. Um, since Getty Images is the largest archive of images and is instrumental in the archival and expansion of digital images, what role is Getty playing in improving more color hue correct images of people of color particularly those of much darker hues since photography photo technology wasn't really designed to properly capture those of darker hues. And then uh, a follow up question, how did these images even make it into the archives? Some of them are older than Getty itself, interested to know the process of how the images were acquired. You're oh, muted again, Bob. <laughs> obviously. Um, great questions, Colby. Um, that's a complex question, actually, in terms of um, color correcting um, and, and hue and darker hues. Um, uh, I don't think it's something we've necessarily considered on mass. Um, look, I think one one of the challenges and complexities of, of presenting um, archives back to the world is how much do you um, how much you keep intact the historical integrity, for better or worse, of that image? Um, and how much do you intervene um, with that image and, and change that historical object? Um, as, as, a, as an archive in the commercial space, um, we, we, we don't, or we try and do both, in fact. Um, so if we look at caption, I think these captions as an example, if we, if we pull a image out of the Bettman collection, for instance, and we look at the original caption from 1963, it may well use language that we're not comfortable with using today. We're not gonna use language, it's legacy historical language, right? Um, so we try and update that caption to bring it in line with, with contemporary thinking. But we also keep that caption because it's important that researchers going back to that image can see how that, that record of history was recorded at the time. Um, so I, I, I don't know of any, in, endeavor to do that, um, but I'm going to take it back and and, um, uh, and and see what we can do. In terms of where those images come from, we do, we go right back to the birth of photography. And it's a long, long chain of um, ownership or people buying defunct archives and then a chain a chain of acquisition. So we can trace our roots back to the London Stereoscopic Company, for instance, um, that was then sold to the BBC. Um, it was uh, who inherited a magazine collection called Picture Post, um, and then a library started to build around amassing a lot of pictures. A physical library was, was constructed um, and catalogued. A whole new cataloging system was brought in to, to make sense of all these photographs. And over time, um, companies like the BBC that um, own these archives would acquire or they would 
have images donated to them right back in the day. People were very happy to donate images to something like the BBC because it was uh, seen as a wonderful place to, to, to store their heritage. Um, and then if you move up into the 80s, um, we, we added, um, or, or a, a cable entrepreneur called Brian Deutsch added um, huge collections, press agencies like the Keystone Collection or the Evening Standard newspaper collections. And then through the 90s, we made a couple of acquisitions, um, but we don't typically uh, buy archives. We're very much now about partnering um, with photographers and partnering with other archives. Um, and it's really about getting those on the platform to share that um, to share that to a global audience. Um, but yeah, it's a long lineage of, of how these, these photographs uh, make their way into it. And it's why we're very careful about um, the, the obligation to care for them. But does that answer your question? Great, thank you, Bob. Um, so we have time for one more question, um, which I'm going to direct towards the panelists. And I can start with you, Don, and then James, and then we'll finish with Demarius. Um, so an audience member asks, will any of you be involved in future articles for this project? Um, if so, what subjects would you like to explore? And I guess as the moderator, I tack on understanding that sometimes the archive itself limits the essays that authors would like to write. So I guess um, an essay that if you have any topics that you'd like to, dis, uh, to explore in the future, I guess, regardless of photo availability or hoping, fingers crossed, that there's photo availability. <laughs> well, um, hoping that there is some uh, photo availability, um, I would like to work on something that is uh, related to uh, Sojourner Truth, um, mainly because there's, you know, a lot of like, uh, I want to say she's misrepresented. There's, she's very heavily photographed uh, because she sold a lot of her photographs, um, but her words are like very heavily misrepresented in history. So she's like largely a mysterious figure because of that. Um, I also wanted to do something on um, African-American uh, female nurses coming from the Civil War on forward, um, mainly because everybody forgets about the fact that African-American women were um, serving in the military as nurses during the Civil War. Um, and they just pick up with World War II. So I wanted to kind of um, see what we could do with that. Um, for me, uh, yes, uh, I have something uh, sim sim similar to Dawn's in, in, in many ways, um, which is I, I'm working on a piece about um, uh, Harriet Tubman, and I, but I want to focus on her um, growth as from a girl to a woman, uh, that, that kind of thing, um, and think about how her femininity um, kind of has been downplayed in many ways, um, but if you're looking at the photo correctly, I think you can also see it um, through through time and, and space. And so that's something I'm looking at, at doing. And I also want to touch on um, the um, the growth and expansion of um, of African American businesses, uh, particularly ones that kind of focus on servicing uh, the African American community, like barber shops and what have you. Uh, that's something else that I'm also looking uh, forward to exploring as well. Um, and was there was there other parts of the question, or did I? capture it you got it demarius okay. is there any uh any would be your fantasy pieces that you'd like to write in the future sure i, I just quickly say uh any themes about black internationalism uh particularly in europe in in london i'd like to to explore that as well great awesome thank you so much um well, we've reached the end of our hour here. So I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us today and for your excellent questions. Um, I am grateful to uh, Bob Ahern, Demarius Johnson, Don Chitty, and James Morgan for sharing their expertise and passion for history. Um, special thanks to everyone at Getty Images whose generosity and very hard work has made the Picturing Black History project possible. Um, so I'd like to give ev uh, ask everyone to please join me in giving them a virtual round of applause. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, especially Jade Lack and Maddie Kerma um, for setting up this webinar today. And if you'd like to see the articles that our authors discussed today, please vis visit our website at Picturing Black History at picturingblackhistory.org. Um, stay safe and healthy and see you next time. Thank you, everyone.